The Spectre Bridegroom by Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Spectre Bridegroom by Washington Irving. He that supper for is dight. He lies full cold, I trow this night. Yes, dream to chamber, I him led. This night Greysteel has made his bed, Sir Egger, Sir Graham, and Sir Greysteel. On the summit of one of the heights of the Odenwald, a wild and romantic tract of Upper Germany that lies not far from the confluence of the Main and the Rhine, there stood many, many years since the castle of the Baron von Landschot. It is now quite fallen to decay, and almost buried among beech trees and dark firs, about which, however, its old watch-tower may still be seen, struggling, like the former possessor I have mentioned, to carry a high head and look down upon the neighbouring country. The baron was a dry branch of the great family of the Katzen Ehlenbogen, and inherited the relics of the property, and all the pride of his ancestors. Though the warlike disposition of his predecessors had much impaired the family possessions, yet the baron still endeavoured to keep up some show of former state. The times were peaceable and the German nobles in general had abandoned their inconvenient old castles, perched like eagles' nests among the mountains, and had built more convenient residences in the valleys. Still the baron remained proudly drawn up in his little fortress, cherishing, with hereditary inveteracy all the old family feuds, so that he was on ill terms with some of his nearest neighbours, on account of disputes that had happened between their great-great-grandfathers. That is, Cat's Elbow the name of a family of those parts very powerful in former times. The appellation, we are told, was given in compliment to a peerless dame of the family celebrated for her fine arm. The baron had but one child, a daughter, but nature, when she grants but one child, always compensates by making it a prodigy, and so it was with the daughter of the baron. All the nurses, gossips, and country cousins assured her father that she had not her equal for beauty in all Germany. And who should know better than they? She had, moreover, been brought up with great care, under the superintendence of two maiden aunts, who had spent some years of their early life at one of the little German courts, and was skilled in all the branches of knowledge necessary to the education of a fine lady. Under their instructions she became a miracle of accomplishments. By the time she was eighteen, she could embroider to admiration, and had worked whole histories of the saints in tapestry, with such strength of expression in their countenances that they looked like so many souls in purgatory. She could read without great difficulty, and had spelled her way through several church legends, and almost all the chivalric wonders of the Heldenbuch. She had even made considerable proficiency in writing, could sign her own name without missing a letter, and so legibly that her aunts could read it without spectacles. She excelled in making little elegant good-for-nothing ladylike knick-knacks of all kinds, was versed in the most abstruse dancing of the day, played a number of airs on the harp and guitar, and knew all the tender ballads of the meaner leader by heart. Her aunts, too, having been great flirts and coquettes in their younger days, were admirably calculated to be vigilant guardians and strict censors of the conduct of their niece. For there is no duenna so rigidly prudent and inexorably decorous, as a superannuated coquette. She was rarely suffered out of their sight, never went beyond the domains of the castle, unless well attended, or rather well watched, had continual lectures read to her about strict decorum and implicit obedience, and as to the men, pah! She was taught to hold them at such a distance, and in such absolute distrust, that, unless properly authorized, she would not have cast a glance upon the handsomest cavalier in the world, no, not if he were even dying at her feet. The good effects of this system were wonderfully apparent. The young lady was a pattern of docility and correctness, while others were wasting their sweetness in the glare of the world, and liable to be plucked and thrown aside by every hand, she was coyly blooming into fresh and lovely womanhood under the protection of those immaculate spinsters, like a rosebud blushing forth among guardian thorns. Her aunts looked upon her with pride and exultation, and vaunted that, though all the other young ladies in the world might go astray, yet, thank heaven, nothing of the kind could happen to the heiress of the Katzen-Ellenbergen. But however scantily the Baron von Landschott 
might be provided with children, his household was by no means a small one, for Providence had enriched him with abundance of poor relations. They, one and all, possessed the affectionate disposition common to humble relatives, were wonderfully attached to the baron, and took every possible occasion to come in swarms and enliven the castle. All family festivals were commemorated by these good people at the baron's expense, and when they were filled with good cheer, they would declare that there was nothing on earth so delightful as these family meetings, these jubilees of the heart. The baron, though a small man, had a large soul, and it swelled with satisfaction at the consciousness of being the greatest man in the little world about him. He loved to tell long stories about the dark old warriors whose portraits looked grimly down from the walls around, and he found no listeners equal to those who fed at his expense. He was much given to the marvellous, and a firm believer in all those supernatural tales with which every mountain and valley in Germany abounds. The faith of his guests exceeded even his own. They listened to every tale of wonder with open eyes and mouth, and never failed to be astonished, even though repeated for the hundredth time. Thus lived the Baron von Landschott, the oracle of his table, the absolute monarch of his little territory, and happy, above all things, in the persuasion that he was the wisest man of the age. At the time of which my story treats, there was a great family gathering at the castle, on an affair of the utmost importance. It was to receive the destined bridegroom of the baron's daughter. A negotiation had been carried on between the father and an old nobleman of Bavaria to unite the dignity of their houses by the marriage of their children. The preliminaries had been conducted with proper punctilio. The young people were betrothed without seeing each other, and the time was appointed for the marriage ceremony. The Count von Altenberg had been recalled from the army for the purpose, and was actually on his way to the barons to receive his bride. Missives had even been received from him from Wurzburg, where he was accidentally detained, mentioning the day and hour when he might be expected to arrive. The castle was in a tumult of preparation to give him a suitable welcome. The fair bride had been decked out with uncommon care. The two aunts had superintended her toilet and quarrelled the whole morning about every article of her dress. The young lady had taken advantage of their contest to follow the bent of her own taste, and fortunately it was a good one. She looked so lovely as youthful bridegroom could desire, and the flutter of expectation heightened the lustre of her charms. The suffusions that mantled her face and neck, the gentle heaving of the bosom, the eye now and then lost in reverie, all betrayed the soft tumult that was going on in her little heart. The ants were continually hovering around her, for maiden aunts are apt to take great interest in affairs of this nature. They were giving her a world of state counsel how to deport herself, what to say, and in what manner to receive the expected lover. The baron was no less busied in preparations. He had in truth nothing exactly to do, but he was naturally a fuming, bustling little man, and he could not remain passive when all the world was in a hurry. He worried from top to bottom of the castle with an air of infinite anxiety. He continually called the servants from their work to exhort them to be diligent, and buzzed about every hall and chamber as idly restless and importunate as a blue-bottle fly on a warm summer's day. In the meantime, the fatted calf had been killed, the clamour of the huntsman, the kitchen was crowded with good cheer, the cellars had yielded up whole oceans of Rhine wine, of Rhine wine and Furner wine, and even the great Heidelberg tun had been laid under contribution. Everything was ready to receive the distinguished guest with sows and brows in the true spirit of German hospitality, but the guest delayed to make his appearance. Hour rolled after hour. The sun that had poured his downward rays upon the rich forest of the Odenwald now just gleamed among the summits of the mountains. The baron mounted the highest tower and strained his eyes in hope of catching a distant sight of the count and his attendants. Once he thought he beheld them, the sound of horns came floating from the valley, prolonged by the mountain echoes. A number of horsemen were seen far below, slowly advancing along the road. But when they had nearly reached the foot of the mountain, they suddenly struck off in a different direction. The last ray of sunshine departed. The bats began to flit by in the twilight. The road grew dimmer and dimmer to the view, and nothing appeared stirring in it, but now and then a peasant lagging homeward from his labour. While the old castle of Lanschot was in this state of perplexity, a very interesting scene was transacting in a different part of the Odenwald. The young Count von Altenberg was tranquilly pursuing his route in that sober jog-trot way in which a man travels toward matrimony when his friends have taken all the trouble and uncertainty of courtship off his hands and a bride is waiting for him, as certainly as a dinner at the end of his journey. 
he had encountered at Wurzburg a youthful companion in arms, with whom he had seen some service on the frontiers. Hermann von Stockenfaust, one of the stoutest hands and worthiest hearts of German chivalry, who was now returning from the army. His father's castle was not far distant from the old fortress of Landshot, although an hereditary feud rendered the families hostile and strangers to each other. In the warm-hearted moment of recognition, the young friends related all their past adventures and fortunes, and the Count gave the whole history of his intended nuptials with a young lady whom he had never seen, but of whose charms he had received the most enrapturing description. As the route of the friends lay in the same direction, they agreed to perform the rest of their journey together, and, that they might do it the most leisurely, set off from Wurzburg at an early hour, the Count having given directions of his retinue to follow and overtake him. They beguiled their wayfaring with recollections of their military scenes and adventures, but the Count was apt to be a little tedious, now and then, about the reputed charms of his bride and the felicity that awaited him. In this way they had entered among the mountains of the Odenwald, and were traversing one of its most lonely and thickly wooded passes. It is well known that the forests of Germany have always been as much infested by robbers as its castle by spectres, and at this time the former were particularly numerous from the hordes of the disbanded soldiers wandering about the country. It will not appear extraordinary, therefore, that the cavaliers were attacked by a gang of these stragglers in the midst of the forest. They defended themselves with bravery, but were nearly overpowered when the Count's retinue arrived to their assistance. At the sight of them the robbers fled, but not until the Count had received a mortal wound. He was slowly and carefully conveyed back to the city of Wurzburg, and a friar, summoned from a neighboring convent, who was famous for his skill in administering to both soul and body, but half of his skill was superfluous. The moments of the unfortunate Count were numbered. With his dying breath he entreated his friend to repair instantly to the castle of Landshot and explain the fatal cause of his not keeping his appointment with his bride. Though not the most ardent of lovers, he was one of the most punctilious of men, and appeared earnestly solicitous that his mission should be speedily and courteously executed. Unless this is done, said he, I shall not sleep quietly in my grave. He repeated these last words with peculiar solemnity. A request at a moment so impressive admitted no hesitation. Stockenfaust endeavoured to soothe him to calmness, promised faithfully to execute his wish, and gave him his hand in solemn pledge. The dying man pressed it in acknowledgment, but soon lapsed into delirium, raved about his bride, his engagements, his plighted word, ordered his horse that he might ride to the castle of Lanshot and expired in the fancied act of vaulting into the saddle. Stockenfaust bestowed a sigh and a soldier's tear on the untimely fate of his comrade, and then pondered on the awkward mission he had undertaken. His heart was heavy, and his head perplexed, for he was to present himself an unbidden guest among hostile people, and to damp their festivity with tidings fatal to their hopes. Still there were certain whisperings of curiosity in his bosom to see this far-famed beauty of Katzen Ellenbergen, so cautiously shut up from the world, for he was a passionate admirer of the sex, and there was a dash of eccentricity and enterprise in his character that made him fond of all singular adventure. Previous to his departure he made all due arrangements with the holy fraternity of the convent for the funeral solemnities of his friend, who was to be buried in the cathedral of Wurzburg, near some of his illustrious relatives, and the mourning retinue of the count took charge of his remains. It is now high time that we should return to the ancient family of Katzen Ellenbogen, who were impatient for their guest, and still more for their dinner, and to the worthy little baron whom we left airing himself on the watchtower. Night closed in, but still no guest arrived. The baron descended from the tower in despair. The banquet which had been delayed from hour to hour could no longer be postponed. The meats were already overdone, the cook in an agony, and the whole household had the look of a garrison that had been reduced by famine. The baron was obliged reluctantly to give orders for the feast without the presence of the guest. All were seated at table, and just on the point of commencing, when the sound of a horn from without the gate gave notice of the approach of a stranger. Another long blast filled the old coats of the castle with its echoes, and was answered by the warder from the walls. The baron hastened to receive his future son-in-law. The drawbridge had been let down, and the stranger was before the gate. He was a tall, gallant cavalier, mounted on a black steed. His countenance was pale, but he had a beaming, romantic eye and an air of stately melancholy. The baron was a little mortified that he should have come in this simple, solitary style. His dignity for a moment was ruffled, 
and he felt disposed to consider it a want of proper respect for the important occasion and the important family with which he was to be connected he pacified himself however with the conclusion that it must have been youthful impatience which had induced him thus to spur on sooner than his attendants i am sorry said the stranger to break in upon you thus unseasonably here the baron interrupted him with a world of compliments and greetings for to tell the truth he prided himself upon his courtesy and eloquence the stranger attempted once or twice to stem the torrent of the wills but in vain for he bowed his head and suffered it to flow on by the time the baron had come to a pause they had reached the inner court of the castle and the stranger was again about to speak when he was once more interrupted by the appearance of the female part of the family leading forth the shrinking and blushing bride he gazed on her for a moment as one entranced it seemed as if his whole soul beamed forth in the gaze and rested upon that lovely form one of the maiden aunts whispered something in her ear she made an effort to speak her moist blue eyes were timidly raised gave a shy glance of inquiry on the stranger and was cast again to the ground the words died away but there was a sweet smile playing upon her lips and a soft dimpling of the cheek that showed her glance had not been unsatisfactory it was impossible for a girl of the fond age of eighteen highly predisposed for love and matrimony not to be pleased with so gallant a cavalier the late hour at which the guest had arrived left no time for parley the baron was peremptory and deferred all particular conversation until the morning and led the way to the untasted banquet it was served up in the great hall of the castle around the walls hung the hard-favoured portraits of the heroes of the house of katzen ellenbogen and the trophies which they had gained in the field and in the chase hacked corslets splintered jousting spears and tattered banners were mingled with the spoils of sylvan warfare the jaws of the wolf and the tusks of the boar grinned horribly among the crossbows and battle axes and a huge pair of antlers branched immediately over the head of the youthful bridegroom the cavalier took but little notice of the company or the entertainment he scarcely tasted the banquet but seemed absorbed in the admiration of his bride he conversed in a low tone that could not be overheard for the language of love is never loud but where is the female ear so dull that it cannot catch the softest whisper of the lover there was a mingled tenderness and gravity in his manner that appeared to have a powerful effect upon the young lady her colour came and went as she listened with deep attention now and then she made some blushing reply and when his eyes were turned away she would steal a sidelong glance at his romantic countenance and heave a gentle sigh of tender happiness it was evident that the young couple were completely enamoured the aunts who were deeply versed in the mysteries of the heart declared that they had fallen in love with each other at first sight the feast went on merrily or at least noisily for the guests were all blessed with those keen appetites that attend upon light purses and mountain air the baron told his best and longest stories and never had told them so well or with such great effect if there was anything marvellous his auditors were lost in astonishment and if anything facetious they were sure to laugh exactly in the right places the baron it is true like most great men was too dignified to utter any joke but a dull one it was always enforced however by a bumper of excellent hochheimer and even a dull joke at one's own table served up with jolly old wine is irresistible many good things were said by poorer and keener wits that would not bear repeating except on similar occasions many sly speeches whispered in the ladies ears that almost convulsed them with suppressed laughter and a song or two roared out by a poor but merry and broad-faced cousin of the baron that absolutely made the maiden aunts hold up their fans amidst all this revelry the stranger guest maintained a most singular and unseasonable gravity his countenance assumed a deeper cast of dejection as the evening advanced and strange as it may appear even the baron's jokes seemed only to render him the more melancholy at times he was lost in thought and at times there was a perturbed and restless wandering of the eyes that bespoke a mind but ill at ease his conversations with the bride became more and more earnest and mysterious lowering clouds began to steal over the fair serenity of her brow and tremors to run through her tender frame all this could not escape the notice of the company their gaiety was chilled by the unaccountable gloom of the bridegroom their spirits were infected whispers and glances were interchanged accompanied by shrugs and dubious shakes of the head the song and the laugh grew less and less frequent there were dreary pauses in the conversation which were at length succeeded by wild tales and supernatural legends one dismal story produced another still more dismal and the baron nearly frightened some of the ladies into hysterics with the history of the goblin horseman 
that carried away the fair Leonora, a dreadful story which has since been put into excellent verse and is read and believed by all the world. The bridegroom listened to this tale with profound attention. He kept his eyes steadily fixed on the baron, and as the story drew to a close, began gradually to rise from his seat, growing taller and taller, until in the baron's entranced eye he seemed almost to tower into a giant. The moment the tale was finished, he heaved a deep sigh and took a solemn farewell of the company. They were all amazement. The baron was perfectly thunderstruck. What? Going to leave the castle at midnight? Why, everything was prepared for this reception. A chamber was ready for him if he wished to retire. The stranger shook his head mournfully and mysteriously. I must lay my head in a different chamber tonight. There was something in this reply, and the tone in which it was uttered, that made the baron's heart misgive him, but he rallied his forces and repeated his hospitable entreaties. The stranger shook his head silently, but positively, at every offer, and waving his farewell to the company, stalked slowly out of the hall. The maiden aunts were absolutely petrified. The bride hung her head, and a tear stole to her eye. The baron followed the stranger to the great court of the castle, where the black charger stood pawing the earth and snorting with impatience. When they had reached the portal, whose deep archway was dimly lighted by a cresset, the stranger paused and addressed the baron in a hollow tone of voice, which the vaulted roof rendered still more sepulchral. Now that we are alone, said he, I will impart to you the reason of my going. I have a solemn and indispensable engagement. Why, said the baron, cannot you send someone in your place? It admits of no substitute. I must attend it in person. I must away to Wootsburg Cathedral. I said the baron, plucking up spirit. But not until tomorrow. Tomorrow you shall take your bride there. No, no, replied the stranger with tenfold solemnity. My engagement is with no bride. The worms. The worms expect me. I am a dead man. I have been slain by robbers. My body lies at Wootsburg at midnight. I am to be buried. The grave is waiting for me. I must keep my appointment. He sprang on his black charger, dashed over the drawbridge, and the clattering of his horse's hoofs was lost in the whistling of the night blast. The baron returned to the hall in the utmost consternation and related what had passed. Two ladies fainted outright. Others sickened at the idea of having banqueted with a spectre. It was the opinion of some that this might be the wild huntsman, famous in German legend. Some talked of mountain sprites, of wood demons, and of other supernatural beings with which the good people of Germany have been so grievously harassed since time immemorial. One of the poor relations ventured to suggest that it might be some sportive evasion of the young cavalier, and that the very gloominess of the caprice seemed to accord with so melancholy a personage. This, however, drew on him that the indignation of the whole company, and especially of the baron, who looked upon him as little better than an infidel, so that he was fain to abjure his heresy as speedily as possible, and come into the faith of the true believers. But whatever may have been the doubts entertained, they were completely put to an end by the arrival next day of regular missives, confirming the intelligence of the young Count's murder and his internment in Wootsburg Cathedral. The dismay at the castle may well be imagined. The baron shut himself up in his chamber. The guests who had come to rejoice with him could not think of abandoning him in his distress. They wandered about the courts or collected in groups in the hall, shaking their heads and shrugging their shoulders at the troubles of so good a man, and sat longer than ever at table, and ate and drank more stoutly than ever by way of keeping up their spirits. But the situation of the widowed bride was the most pitiable. To have lost a husband before she had even embraced him, and such a husband. If the very spectre could be so gracious and noble, what must have been the living man? She filled the house with lamentations. On the night of the second day of her widowhood, she had retired to her chamber, accompanied by one of her aunts, who insisted on sleeping with her. The aunt, who was one of the best tellers of ghost stories in all Germany, had just been recounting one of her longest, and had fallen asleep in the very midst of it. The chamber was remote and overlooked a small garden. The niece lay pensively gazing at the beams of the rising moon as they trembled on the leaves of an aspen tree before the lattice. The castle clock had just told midnight, when a soft strain of music stole up from the garden. She rose hastily from her bed and stepped lightly to the window. A tall figure stood among the shadows of the trees. As it raised its head, 
a beam of moonlight fell upon the countenance. Heaven and earth, she beheld the spectre bridegroom. A loud shriek at that moment burst upon her ear, and her aunt, who had been awakened by the music, and had followed her silently to the window, fell into her arms. When she looked again, the spectre had disappeared. Of the two females, the aunt now required the most soothing, for she was perfectly beside herself with terror. As to the young lady, there was something even in the spectre of her lover that seemed endearing. There was still the semblance of manly beauty, and though the shadow of a man is but little calculated to satisfy the affection of a lovesick girl, yet, where the substance is not to be had, even that is consoling. The aunt declared she would never sleep in that chamber again. The niece, for once, was refractory, and declared as strongly that she would sleep in no other in the castle. The consequence was that she had to sleep in it alone. But she drew a promise from her aunt not to relate the story of the spectre, lest she should be denied the only melancholy pleasure left her on earth, that of inhabiting the chamber over which the guardian shade of her lover kept its nightly visuals. How long the good old lady would have observed this promise is uncertain, for she dearly loved to talk of the marvellous, and there is a triumph in being the first to tell a frightful story. It is, however, still quoted in the neighbourhood as a memorable instance of female secrecy, that she kept it to herself for a whole week, when she was suddenly absolved from all further restraint by intelligence brought to the breakfast-table one morning that the young lady was not to be found. Her room was empty, the bed had not been slept in, the window was open, and the bird had flown. The astonishment and concern with which the intelligence was received can only be imagined by those who have witnessed the agitation which the mishaps of a great man cause among his friends. Even the poor relations pause for a moment from the indefatigable labours of the trencher, when the aunt, who had at first been struck speechless, wrung her hands and shrieked out, The goblin! The goblin! She's carried away by the goblin! In a few words she related the fearful scene of the garden, and concluded that the spectre must have carried off his bride. Two of the domestics corroborated the opinion, for they had heard the clattering of a horse's hoofs down the mountain about midnight, and had no doubt that it was the spectre on his black charger, bearing her away to the tomb. All present were struck with a direful probability, for events of the kind are extremely common in Germany, as many well-authenticated histories bear witness. What a lamentable situation was that of the poor baron! What a heart-rending dilemma for a fond father, and a member of the great family of Katzen Ellenbergen! His only daughter had either been rapt away to the grave, or he was to have some wood demon for a son-in-law, and perchance a troop of goblin grandchildren. As usual, he was completely bewildered, and all the castle in an uproar. The men were ordered to take horse and scour every road and path and glen of the Odenwald. The baron himself had just drawn on his jack-boots, girded on his sword, and was about to mount his steed to sally forth on the doubtful quest, when he was brought to a pause by a new apparition. A lady was seen approaching the castle, mounted on a palfrey, attended by a cavalier on horseback. She galloped up to the gate, sprang from her horse, and, falling at the baron's feet, embraced his knees. It was his lost daughter, and a companion, the spectre bridegroom. The baron was astounded. He looked at his daughter, then at the spectre, and almost doubted the evidence of his senses. The latter, too, was wonderfully improved in his appearance since his visit to the world of spirits. His dress was splendid, and set off a noble figure of manly symmetry. He was no longer pale and melancholy. His fine countenance was flushed with a glow of youth, and joy rioted in his large dark eyes. The mystery was soon cleared up. The cavalier, for in truth, as you must have known all the while, he was no goblin, announced himself as Sir Hermann von Starkenfaust. He related his adventure with the young count. He told how he had hastened to the castle to deliver the unwelcome tidings, but that the eloquence of the baron had interrupted him in every attempt to tell his tale how the sight of the bride had completely captivated him, and that to pass a few hours near her, he had tacitly suffered the mistake to continue, how he had been sorely perplexed in what way to make a decent retreat, until the baron's goblin stories had suggested his eccentric exit. Now fearing the feudal hostility of the family, he had repeated his visits by stealth, had haunted the garden beneath the young lady's window, had won, had won, had borne away in triumph, and in a word, had wedded the fair. Under any other circumstances, the baron would have been inflexible, for he was tenacious of paternal authority and devoutly obstinate in all family feuds. But he loved his daughter, 
He had lamented her as lost. He rejoiced to find her still alive, and though her husband was of a hostile house, yet, thank heaven, he was not a goblin. There was something, it must be acknowledged, that did not exactly accord with his notion of strict veracity, in the joke the night had passed upon him of being a dead man. But several old friends present, who had served in the wars, assured him that every stratagem was excusable in love, and that the cavalier was entitled to a special privilege, having lately served as a trooper. Matters, therefore, were happily arranged. The baron pardoned the young couple on the spot. The revels at the castle were resumed. The poor relations overwhelmed this new member of the family with loving kindness. He was so gallant, so generous, and so rich. The aunts, it is true, were somewhat scandalized that their system of strict seclusion and passive obedience should be so badly exemplified, but attributed it to all their negligence in not having the windows grated. One of them was particularly mortified at having her marvellous story marred, and that the only spectre she had ever seen should turn out to be a counterfeit. But the niece seemed perfectly happy at having found him substantial flesh and blood. And so the story ends. End of The End, The Sketchbook, The Spectre Bridegroom, A Traveller's Tale by Washington Irving Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama